When answering this question, it is almost too easy to be obtuse and talk about what it is not. But of course, the word disciplinary can be prefixed by so many other words that it's worth going through them to solidify a common meaning. We all use these words and often they mean something different to different people. And sometimes we use the same words and mean something else. This is very much in the vein of all bowls are dishes, but not all dishes are bowls. So let's get into these common terms that cause us some consternation. There are others, but you will recognize your meaning of them in what I say next, I'm sure. Well, we have multidisciplinary. And in this scenario, you might have two different disciplines approaching a problem from different angles. For example, you might have an occupational therapist involved in fall prevention research and an academic engineer involved in research for fall prevention too. But in this case, in order to develop some med tech wearable device. Crucially, in multidisciplinarity, our OT and engineer may never meet there are no chocolates and flowers. They both continue down often dead ends, creating non-progressive or unfit for purpose solutions. This can take 10 years or more for these to happen in parallel or worse if they're done in a serial manner. If they are contingent, this is sometimes called cross-disciplinarity. How can we make this more efficient? This is where interdisciplinarity comes in. If the OT and engineer could talk to each other, then the engineer would get a sense of what the behaviour of an infirm or older adult was and get some guidance on what is required of the med tech, leading to greater chance of fit for purpose solutions that also have a chance of succeeding. But what if we brought the infirm or older adults views into account as well? Imagine spending nine years developing wearable technology nobody with an ounce of pride would ever wear. Why do we not include the public or patient voice in our inquiries? Well, we should, because this is the way to true efficiency and purpose fit solutions. And this is called transdisciplinarity. Now, in my own institute, we demand the inclusion of public patient involvement in the projects that we foster. We still call it interdisciplinarity. So all transdisciplinary disciplinary work is interdisciplinary, but not all interdisciplinary work is transdisciplinary. So who does interdisciplinary research? Well, it's not for everybody. And we must remember that all this interdisciplinary work needs a solid disciplinary grounding in the skills and expertise that are being brought together to address a common challenge. But you do need a leader who won't be invested in all of those disciplines, but somebody who holds all of the strings to the puppet, so to speak. And you need the whole team to be invested in not just the challenge, but the idea that they are not going to know everything about everything and that it is incumbent upon everybody to feel free to ask the apparently stupid question. The environment that you build around these teams, therefore, needs to be free, easy, safe and collegial. Everybody should come away feeling like they have learned something new, that they are participating in a crucible of possibility. One way to do this is to never let your team lose sight of ultimately who they are trying to help, which is easy in health related research and even easier when you've included those people as part of your stakeholder group interactions, if not part of your team. And that brings us into transdisciplinarity again. In essence, egos need to be left at the door, which isn't something everybody can do. But that is why interdisciplinarity isn't for everyone. And this should not be forced. Why do we do interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research? Well, there are many vectors on which we ride into the land of interdisciplinarity. It may be that a solution to a particular challenge is required. A good example of this is the Teesside Aneurysm Group, which we set up to create a more holistic prediction of rupture risk for brain aneurysms that goes beyond the current limited factor of size. This team includes computer scientists in the field of image analysis and AI and web app development, neuroscientists, psychologists, biologists, sociologists, statisticians, neurosurgeons and others. 
Another vector is more curiosity, some might say problem driven, where different disciplines get together to understand challenges from different dimensions. A good example of this is the Wellcome Trust funded Hearing the Voice project from the Institute of Medical Humanities, led by Durham, in which scientists, social scientists, clinicians, voice hearers, creative facilitators, arts and humanities scholars all get together over a period of near, nearly 10 years to understand the issue of voice hearing from neuroscience through behaviour to the experiential realm. Despite it not being a primary goal, it has resulted in a drive to normalise voice hearing and the development of a handbook for practitioners and people who experience voice hearing called MUSE, Managing Unusual Sensory Experiences. And there are lots of other examples of destinations of these vectors, including pain, infant sleep, sudden infant death syndrome or brain injury rehabilitation. So how do we do interdisciplinary research? Well, here at the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing, we build our teams based on expertise, but prune and refresh them according to engagement and collegiality. As UKRI are talking a better talk with respect to interdisciplinarity, the walk they walk is less consistent as they are at the mercy of reviewers who may have a poor understanding of how interdisciplinarity is possible or what outcomes one might expect. This is changing with the development of the UKRI Interdisciplinary College of Experts. So teams may form around a particular grant call, but given the time involved in setting up solid groups, this is only becoming more common with the offer of network grants recently through UKRI. With the caveat that a network does not necessarily encourage interdisciplinarity, but is absolutely should. In our experience to date, we have built a framework whereby academics in different disciplines can see where their work might relate to other disciplines that may shine a light and advance their shared aims. This is what we call our Challenge Academy matrix that has vertical and horizontal planks. Essentially, if we take our Pain Academy as an example, we cannot fully understand this issue or mitigate pain unless we take mental health, the workplace, ageing issues, race, culture and inequality and physical activity into account. There are probably more, but we are not omnipotent. Worth noting that there is crosstalk to be mindful of both between cross cuts and vertical planks themselves. When we are building interdisciplinary teams, both in terms of the expertise that we hold or challenges or problems that are brought to us, we horizon scan such that when UKRI realise a focused goal is required, we have something on the shelf, in addition to engaging with the open call route. We encourage all of our academics and projects therein to follow a particular model, ensuring that the project addresses the beginning, the middle, and the end. As academics, we're very good at identifying the right question, describing the problem, its scope and effect. This is the beginning and the middle, if you will. But we are less good at translating this knowledge to fixing the problem in the end. And so we encourage our teams to include implementation pathways for possible interventions early in the genesis of the group to ensure fit for purpose solutions and that facilitators and barriers can be optimised and mitigated through the work of the group. As an institute, we engage with our regional and international networks and we engage them with our groups as far as possible as this kind of action can knock years off your Gantt chart. We must also recognise that the beginning, middle and end are not linear and are often contingent upon each other. Lastly, I would say, in addition to changing the lives of the people whose challenges we are seeking to address, we also need to remember that the work that we are doing is as much about the process and we need to be evangelical about this. Once you have had success in this sphere, it's very hard to imagine working in any other way as this kind of systems thinking and action is the way forward. We must understand all of the influences on health issues, understand their valence and value in order to be able to choose where best to intervene, recognising that this won't be the same for everyone. 
It gives us a necessary overview that moves us away from the siloed aperture view that our disciplines often give us. So this is the only way to bring us from helping some of the people some of the time to helping all of the people all of the time. <laughs>